Good morning, church. Try that again. Good morning, church. Welcome this morning. Please come in and take a seat. A special welcome if you are visiting with us this morning or if you're back after some time. It's lovely to have you here. This morning as we start, I'd like to read Psalm 96. Sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Proclaim his salvation day after day. Declare his glory among the nations, his marvellous deeds among all people. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all all gods. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and glory are in his sanctuary. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. Say among the nations, the Lord reigns. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. He will judge the peoples with equity. Let the heavens rejoice, let the earth be glad, let the seas resound and all that is in it. Let the fields be jubilant and everything in them. Then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy. They will come before the Lord, for he comes. He comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his truth. He will come again and he will judge the world. But in the meantime, he's in perfect control of everything that's happening. And this morning we praise his name and we proclaim his salvation, the salvation that gives us hope and is hope for the world. Let's stand and sing this morning. Yeah. 
great are you, Lord, and we worship you this morning. We praise your great and glorious name. And we thank you that we are your people and you are our God. And in a world where so much is happening that brings great grief to our hearts, we thank you that we can trust in your sovereign purposes. We thank you that you are king over the whole earth. And this morning we ask, Lord, that you will be with us. We ask, Lord, that by your spirit you will speak to our hearts. And Lord, we want to give honour and glory to your name this morning. So we ask, Lord, that you will help us to do that. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Let's continue singing. Welcome again. Uh, a few items of church family news for us this morning. Uh, most of you should have received the newsletter by email on Friday from the church office. If you haven't received it or you don't receive it and would like to get it, there's a sheet in the foyer. You can sign up there. Our long-awaited new church directory is out today. And you can grab your copy from Julianne at the end of the service in the foyer. It's one per family. The cost is free for the first one. If you want any more than, than that, you're going to have to negotiate with Julianne. <laughs> <laughs> and we do want to say thank you to Scott for the photos and a really big thank you to Julianne. She's put a lot of hours into producing this new directory for us and we want to thank her 
this morning. Our church prayer night is on uh, this Tuesday night, 7.30 p.m. in the foyer. Please join us. Uh, you do not have to pray aloud if that's not something you're comfortable doing, but it's really important that we join together in prayer for our church and for the wider world. Guess who's coming to lunch? This is a great opportunity for you to get to know people you don't already know. Uh, so if you would like to be a host or a guest on Sunday the 12th of November, you need to fill out the slip in the foyer table and put it into the little uh, basket that's there. I know that there's a number of people who want to be guests. Uh, last I heard, the number of people who wanted to be host was a little lower. So if that's something you feel comfortable doing, don't be shy. Everything is not on you. The people who are coming do help. So uh, it's a wonderful chance to get to know people. And I know that Kuti and those who will put the, uh, the tables together, the houses together, will do a really good job of matching you up with some people you know and some people you don't. Uh, so slips are due back on the 5th of November for that so that they can get everything prepared. Uh, young adults, uh, there's a fellowship night for you this uh, Thursday night and George will be speaking, so don't miss that. And then next Sunday you are having a pizza following the service, $5 per person. All right, Operation Christmas Child Boxes are due back today. However, if you forgot you do have the opportunity to bring your box to the church office during the week. Just make sure that you take note of the opening hours for the church office and have them back no later than Friday. There's a diary date there and just a couple of other things. Uh, we heard this morning that Elizabeth Ison, who some of you will know, is very gravely ill with cancer and not expected to last too much longer, so please keep Graham and Elizabeth in your prayers and uh, also I will be going to Romania to see the Pigeon family after I uh, go to a work conference in Malta so if anyone would like to send something small that's cards or letters or drawings for Isla and Tilly uh, I need to have them actually um, by the 29th of October would be good but if you want any more information do come and see me. Thank you. Children, it's now time for you to go out. Good morning. Before we uh, start in prayer, I just wanted to read those lyrics that we just sang, uh, which are just so impactful. Behold him there, the risen lamb, my perfect spotless righteousness, the great unchangeable I am, the king of glory and of grace, one with himself, I cannot die. My soul is purchased by his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Saviour and my God. And through Christ we'll now pray um, to our Father. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, you are the great God, the everlasting Lord, the Ancient of Days, the creator of everyone and everything. In your hand to the depths of the earth, the mountain peaks belong to you. You are perfect love, perfect faithfulness, perfect justice, the beginning and the end. You are an unfailing love and exalted on high. Heaven cries out, holy, 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 in your almighty presence. We give thanks to you for your love endures forever. And out of the depths, Lord, we cry to you. Hear our voice, our cries for mercy. Lord, if you kept a record of our sins, who could stand? We know that the cross is our only salvation, our full and complete redemption. We know, Father, that even our good works are stained with sin, and they will prove worthless when we stand before you. But we know in you, Lord, there is forgiveness. Through the promised horn of David, the true Messiah, our Lord Jesus Christ. We praise you, the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Lord, help us to serve you in a way which pleases you. We pray that every member of our church would seek to share the good news with the lost around us. 
Help us to be salt and light among those we live and work with, to proclaim your glorious truths to a rich and dying world. For those who are in error, Lord, who have walked away from the truth, help us to lead them back. For the doubting, help us lead them back to communion with you. For those in darkness, help us to snatch them from the fire. And God, at this time, we're in mourning particularly for the situation we see unfurling in the Middle East, in a place where the footprints of your Son once graced the earth. Lord, we're struggling to know, we sometimes struggle to know what to pray in this situation, but we know that your Holy Spirit intervenes for us. But we do know, Lord, that you are the only hope in this situation. We pray in your sovereignty for a peaceful end to this situation, that these people made in your image will not see further death. We pray that leaders involved would act in the wisdom that only comes from you. We ask that hostages would be freed, towns would be liberated, and that families would be reunited. Particularly, our God, for the little children who are involved in this terror, we plead for their safety and protection. We pray also for the church in Israel and Palestine, that it would be a beacon of light in these communities, and it would steadfastly hold to the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. And Lord, we pray most of all that these people would come to know the true Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, in our country, we know we live in tumultuous times and we pray for our leaders at this difficult time, particularly those who are working and advising in national security and foreign affairs. We continue to pray for laws that honour you, Father, that protect the vulnerable and allow for the flourishing of the church. We pray particularly for the Indigenous people of our country at this time, Lord, those in broken families, suffering from health conditions and other impacts, that the government would find effective solutions for the better of our fellow Australians and that you would also raise up the church to help these people. And we pray for a united country, Lord, but most of all, we pray for a country that bends the knee to Christ. We pray for this conversion bill we've heard about, Father, that this bill would be seen for what it truly is and that it would be defeated. For those who deal with the sins in our midst, Lord, we pray that we as a body would treat them with love, grace and truth. And for all of us, Lord, we pray that we would strive for purity from sin, putting it to death at every opportunity. Lord, we bring you our church here at Castle Hill. We ask that you would strengthen the leadership here at CHBC to stand on your word, to care for the flock and to lead with humility. We thank you for the ministry of Ross and we pray for him and Bev as they settle in. We pray for Ross's time each week preparing to preach your scriptures and that he would speak boldly and for your glory alone. And Lord, for the pastoral search process, we give this into your hands. We pray that you would lead us to the man that you want for this church and give the committee your wisdom. For our ministries, Father, we bring you our ESL ministry. We thank you for the great opportunity we have to share with the community in this way. We pray that you would bless the leaders, Dennis, Justin, Peter, and others that help, and we pray that this ministry would continue to show fruit. Bless conversations with those attending, and we would pray that they would all come to know your love. And Lord, for the young children at Sunday School right now, we pray their lessons would honour you, that, that the leaders would be able to teach and instruct the children in your ways faithfully. Help the teachers to have stamina and endurance to teach your word to these young souls. And our Father, as we prepare to hear your word a bit later in the service, humble us as we sit under it. We pray that we would glean every practical truth, that you would bless the preacher, that you would be glorified as the Holy Spirit impresses the message on our hearts. May we love your precepts more and more. Our God, we pray that we would be a church that honours you. In Jesus' name, amen. Ross is bringing us the second part of his message from Romans 8 this morning. And last week, we sang a song from Romans 8, and Ross asked if we could sing it again. Well, we're going to sing it again. And uh, can I again invite you to take note of the words as we sing? Please stand.
This morning we're reading from God's Word from Romans chapter 8, verse 20, uh, sorry, 26 to 39, chapter 8. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God knew, for knew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, or any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. As we mentioned last week, some people see Romans 8 as the uh, greatest chapter in the Bible. And uh, I encourage you to have a little conversation at home to discuss over lunch the greatest chapter in the Bible as far as you're concerned. Uh, and uh, it is a marvellous chapter, isn't it? And those end verses, if you went around a number of uh, cemeteries, not that that's what we do, and looked at gravestones, how many gravestones from Christians would have those final verses 38 and 39 on them? Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your mercy towards us. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you have called us to be your people. May we take that calling and live it out uh, through the power of your spirit, we pray. Amen. Don't forget your cards. Uh, please fill them in. Uh, if there's any prayer request, uh, anything that you wish to say, any follow-up, and you'll see there's a little box on the side there next to the offerings uh, where you can put your card in, and particularly if you're a visitor, please take time to do that for us. That would be wonderful. And uh, let me also say, um, we're looking at a baptismal service coming up, and if you would like to be, uh, believe God's calling you to be baptised, 
uh, a member of the church as well, please make that little note there and we will follow that up as well. Romans 8, step 2. Life is a part of life in the, in the capacity of being children of the risen Christ. Children of the risen Christ. Let's make sure that we're operating here. Ah, there we go. We do live in a complex world. And one of the difficulties of our world, it tends to go up and down like a yo-yo. So I had the privilege with a team to be in Moscow uh, during the Gorbachev Reformation. And so the days of Lenin and Stalin were giving way to much more freedom and democracy uh, under Gorbachev. Now, of course, Putin's taken us all back again and gone into the Ukraine. Uh, Russia, Moscow can be a really sad, depressing place when you mix and share with people and see the despondency, the, the, the lack of hope there appears to be. With Gorbachev, that seemed to be changing. I was with a group of Christians from the unregistered church in Moscow, Ma mainly Baptists make up the unregistered church. Uh, we were at Moscow uh, University uh, addressing law school students, a thousand of them. And the auditorium was full and behind us is the rector or dean of the law school and numerous members of his faculty. Uh, the dean through an interpreter pointed out to me that these unbelieving Christians, who he had no antagonism towards personally, they weren't allowed to be students in any university. In fact, their children weren't allowed to be students in any university. So if you were a Christian and you felt under God, although you were supportive and doing Romans 13, but you couldn't be registered where a state was restricting so many of your freedoms, if you were part of the unregistered church in, uh, in Russia, the implication just wasn't for you, it was for your children and your children's children. They weren't even allowed to study in a university. So imagine what jobs and future they had. And in fact, he pointed out to me, the, uh, the rector of the uh, law school, that only you know, just before the Gorbachev Reformation, uh, they had removed a student in his final year when they discovered that his parents were part of the unregistered church. Just kicked him out of university for that. Now, he wasn't saying that's great. He was simply saying that's how the world was. And as he pointed out, most of the believers that were now worshipping and leading his uh, students and faculty, most of them were cleaners or whatever at the university. They weren't allowed to study. Now, an hour has gone on and uh, you know, time is getting short and the believers are still going for it. They've done about four sermons, sung about 25 hymns and they've really belted it out. They're taking no prisoners. I mean, this is their first chance back in here on the centre stage. Do it with love and grace. But you can imagine, if, if you've been restricted through your life and your kids have been restricted, when you get the opportunity to tell everybody, those who have persecuted you, those who haven't allowed you to even be students here, well, nicely, you tell them. So, through translators, I could hear that the gospel had Every, every possible way of explaining the gospel had been done and every gospel song had been sung. The rector who's sitting next to me through a translator says, uh, 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 please, uh, Dr. Clifford, don't do this, do something else. I mean, we've got it, we've got the bit. you do something else. I want to hear you, your team, you do something else. So I did one of these prayers. He's reading Romans 8. I, I didn't know what to do. What am, I, I meant to hear to bring a message. Do, what, what do I do? I've never been in this place. So up goes, a, I have no idea. Back comes Q&A. Q&A. So they finish. I go to the stage and I simply say, look, you've heard it all. Uh, they've done so well. No point in me going over that. This is being translated, although much, many of the students understood. I said, 
let's do Q&A. Come and ask me questions. There's mics here, come and ask questions. Either me or one of the team will answer them. I'm waiting, then the first guy comes up. And his question is this, John 21, 6, if you're interested. His question is, your Bible is silly, isn't it? Oh, that's a great start. Because why on earth did Jesus tell his disciples to throw their nets out on the right-hand side of the boat? That's the first question. Up goes another groan <laughs> before I answer. Uh, is this a setup? This is genuine? And I got this really strong sense back. Ross, it's a setup, they're testing you. Trying to find out who you really are. So I said, oh, well, that's easy. I think Jesus told them to do that because he was right-handed. <laughs> and the whole place erupted positively. And then came question after question. How does your God explain suffering? Is your New Testament really what we believe it to be? Rubbish. But the one that we received more than any other question through Moscow and Belarus, which absolutely staggered us, was this question. Marxism, Lenin, Stalinism has failed. Will your Jesus bring in the millennium? Will your Jesus bring in the new day? That was the number one question. And Romans 8 says, yes, he will. He has. It's already started through those who know the risen Christ, the one who died and rose again. We are already part of that inbreaking of the kingdom of God. But more so, it will have a culmination where all is restored, all is good, and the kingdom of God, the millennium, is lived out according to our purposes, God's purposes. And here we find four freedoms as we go to step two. Four freedoms you and I have, four freedoms that this church has because Jesus Christ has risen and the Holy Spirit is poured out into our lives and into this community. Here are four freedoms that Paul's really honing in on. And the first two are interesting, I believe, because the world understands something of Christianity but doesn't get the first two. You've got to be in the camp. You've got to be part of the family of God to really understand what the first two are about and what they're saying. And the first one is extraordinary. It says we will have freedom from paralysis in prayer. Like my paralysis before these students, what on earth do I do here? We'll have freedom from paralysis. Whether our paralysis is caused, as Romans 7 points out, because we're still battling we're children of God, but still battling with temptation and sin. Whether that's part of our paralysis, we know that we are doing things at the moment that we don't want to do and we're in a world we don't want to be and we are in paralysis because we just know that the Holy Spirit is not doing in our lives what we want the Holy Spirit to do. Or whether the paralysis is because Paul has pointed out in the early verses in chapter 8, we are suffering or persecuted, uh, we are in weakness because of the situations of being a Christian in the modern world, or whether our weaknesses, what he refers to in these verses, is because we don't know what to do with respect to our children or we're in hospital lying there, no idea of what the future is or the prognosis. We don't know what to do. Because our sin, our journey of trial and stress, our fear of the unknown and what's happening in our own body, mentally and with our own family, we are in paralysis. And what happens is, the Holy Spirit, the one, remember, Jesus and the Holy Spirit are distinct persons, but the experience is the same. The Holy Spirit is in us and our community through the risen Christ, he comes and aids us and helps us. And in the Greek, it's a really strong word. He really comes alongside. Not, oh, how are you doing? No, I'll see you later. Have a good day. No, he really comes and bats for us. He is really there, says these verses. And here you see the Trinity at work. Notice, by the way, in the earlier verses, creation groans for redemption. And we groan 
to be the people that God's called us to be and to be adopted. And here we see the Holy Spirit groans. Does that mean the Holy Spirit is as in ignorance like us? No. What the Holy Spirit is saying is, He's encouraging us, even if we don't know what words to say, even if we don't know what is appropriate, the Holy Spirit is urging us to groan, to cry out, to take that up before God. And you see, the Father in this verse is searching our hearts. He really knows what the groan is about. And he's also searching or in cooperation with the Holy Spirit who obviously knows what our groans are about. So when I'm standing there knowing what do I do, it's the Holy Spirit who's encouraging me to just cry, what do I do here, God? That's the work of the Spirit. I don't know the answer. He's encouraging me just to cry out. But he knows. And God the Father who looks into my life and knows the mind of the Spirit, he knows. And what's more, in verse 34, the risen Jesus is up there advocating for us as well. It's a Trinity combination. The Spirit at work making sure we groan, the Father understanding what we're groaning about, and Jesus, our advocate, also up there working for us. You compare that to the world that Paul was in the world of Rome. In the world of Rome, there's all sorts of gods. Sun gods, this god, make sure you go to Caesar. All impersonal, most of them material, none of them really spiritual, many of them myth. (laughs) And you're desperate, you know, you're knocking at the door, you know, who's going to help us in war? Is it the sun god, this god, that victory god, where do we go? All impersonal, all desperate. And the breakthrough here is... You're a child of God. You're in a relationship with Abba, Father, Daddy. Your prayer life is beyond anything the world has ever seen. Jesus advocates for you. I know what's on your heart. And your Holy Spirit also walks with you, encouraging you to groan, to cry out. Wow, isn't that extraordinary? The world don't have that. They're still crying out to material gods or hoping someone's going to hear them. They're not quite sure who. They're pointing their bat up to heaven when a cricket has died, hoping that somehow the person in heaven who's passed away is looking down on them. What's this all about? Here, we pray. Jesus advocates, God knows And the Spirit is saying, Ross, yell out, yell out. God will take your groans and uncertainty. Wow. (laughs) Freedom also from the fear of the unknown. Now, guys, this is really important. This is one of my favourite verses. And I'm sure it's a favourite verse of so many of us when you read verse 28, where we see... And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. Now, I think it's right that the subject here is God. And we'll see that as this passage moves on. God, God's the subject. And you have to love him. This is not a honky-dory, all will be great, don't worry about life. Oh, you know, I'm sure it'll all come good in the long run leave you with it, but there's always, you know, a silver lining. (laughs) It's not that kind of general hope and perspective that, you know, when there's winter, there's summer. It's more than that. But can only again be known by those who love the Lord Jesus Christ. And what is being said here, if you and I love the Lord Jesus Christ, then God will work all things for good not some things not you know he's going to balance the scale so make sure you get 51% working out for you all things now for most of us we know that a lot of the stuff that happens in our life we don't see how that happens for many many years later and perhaps 
not at all this side of eternity. But we know God is trustworthy and faithful. We've seen it, we've witnessed it, and he says, all things will work out for those who love me. Uh, I just think that's one of the most extraordinary promises in Scripture. Remember what I said earlier um, in the series, and I don't know if it's theologically correct, I think it is, I pray it is. God may be slow, but he's never late. God may be slow, but he's never late. Think about it. All things work together for those who love him. I've given a quote from J.I. Packer, and some of you will be Packer fans, and uh, you can access that uh, from me or the office. But it goes on to the next point we're going to look at. But look at how Packer describes this relationship in Romans 8. We've got this prayer life, we've got a God who cares for us in all aspects of life. Packer says, what matters supremely, therefore, is not in the last analysis the fact that I know God, but the larger fact which underlines it, the fact that he knows me. This is God directed, not us directed. I'm graven on the palm of his hands. That's why he's going to work it out for good. I'm never out of his mind. You're never out of God's mind. All my knowledge of him depends on his sustained initiative in knowing me. I know him because he first knew me and continues to know me. He knows me as a friend, one who loves me. And there is no moment when his eye is off me or his attention distracted from me and no moment, therefore, when his care falters. No moment. All things work together for those who love God. And then after those kind of two secret things that the people of God know, not because they've got some sort of hidden religion, but unless you love God, you don't know that prayer life. And unless you love God, you don't have that certainty about all things working for good for those who love him. And if you don't know God today, Romans 8, 28, if you don't know Jesus, ought to be enough in itself to tick the card and say, I want to become a child of God. But then Paul goes on and gives us five affirmations. Uh, people at times call this the golden chain. So he's pointed out very clearly that uh, we have this prayer life, uh, that we have this confidence that God is with us no matter what. And remember, this is Paul who's writing his life has gone up and down and all over the place, from shipwrecks to uh, prison, he's going to face execution. He's the one who's writing this. And then comes this affirmation. How can we be so confident? Who am I? This is the key. This is the key. We can say these things because of these five affirmations. Now, remember Paul Keating, uh, and this is not a political comment, it's just showing the despair of humanity. Paul Keating, when he was uh, Prime Minister of Australia, was asked what his contribution would be when the world judged his period in Parliament. His response would be that in the history of the world and the way things are, I am nothing more than a half a grain of sand on the beach. Think about it. With God, that's what those Russian students are saying. Is there anything more? Is there a millennium? Is there an inbreaking? Or I'm just half a grain of sand on the beach? No. You are more than that. And Paul is saying, this is who we are. This is who we are if you're in Christ. Firstly, God foreknew us. Jeremiah 1.5. He knew us before we are in the womb. We were always in his mind. We were always going to be. God didn't wake up and go, oh, I see so-and-so's had a new baby. That's wonderful. No. We were always part of his plan. Always. From the beginning of time. Ross, Steve, whoever was always in the mind and plan of God. Think of the Packer quote, he foreknew us, even before we were born. 
And then we see that he predestined us. He called us, predestined us, chose us, elected us to be part of his family forever. Now, we could spend a lot of time on predestination and election. We'll do that another day. But the key thing to learn about this here is what Paul is making very clear that it's not about me. (laughs) It's not about me choosing God. It's about God always loving me, caring for me, knowing me, and then predestining me to be part of his family. It's got nothing to do with me. It's always salvation we look to God. By the way, you need to look at these verses because um, some cults will really struggle, and others, with verse uh, 29. And so, for God foreknew, he also predestined, he elected, he, 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 he chose, he chose us to be conformed to the likeness of his son. Now, no problem here, we're called for a purpose, by the way, just in predestined us to say, oh, well, Scott's in, that's it, tick, let's go on to somebody else or whatever. No, Scott's been called for a purpose. I don't think there is anything Scott doesn't do, but he's been called for a purpose. We've all been called for a purpose, and that purpose is to be in the image of Christ. We've been called to be compassionate. We've been called to be about justice. We've been called to be about mercy. We've been called to take the gospel into, the, into our neighbourhood. We've been called to use our gifts. We haven't been called just to sit here. <laughs> He's predestined us to the image of his son. Now, the cults, Christadelphians and others, by the way, cults is not an offensive word. I'm not using that offensive way. Cult just simply is a word for those who have a faith or a belief that's outside the mainstream. So, in Judaism, Christianity was a cult. It's not an offensive word, it's a descriptive word. Now, maybe we could find a better word, but that's how it is. So, what you've got is the cults have really two problems with this. He is the image, Christ is the image, look at it. He is the image, in verse, uh, verse 29... He is the likeness of his son. Likeness of his son? You're the likeness of his son? How could that be? God can't have anyone like him. But more significantly, he is first more born among many brothers. So Jesus can't be God. He is first born, he has a birth, and he has brothers. Two things. Sorry, I'm out. And I can tell you in all love, if you are dealing with a Christadelphian or other person who's on those outside extremes of Christianity, you'll find they're the two big ones. Jesus couldn't have brothers. God can't have brothers, and he's the firstborn. Well, firstborn there, you've got to take scripture as an entirety. Firstborn there in Hebrew thought is simply a place of honour and esteem, Uh, you know, He with the Father is one of honour and esteem. And brothers, you see, that's talking about his humanity. Uh, The firstborn is talking about his divinity and the next one is talking about his humanity, both God and man, God and man. And you can show his divinity as we've seen before from Romans, from Revelation 22, that uh, that God is Alpha, Jesus Alpha and Omega, the first and the last terms that are only reserved for God, or even Romans 1, which makes it very clear that Jesus is God as well. But that's where they struggle. Firstborn and also brothers. But we have been predestined. We've been called to be the children of God and to live it out. Someone say, oh, Christian living is really hard. I mean... I I don't know what holiness looks like. Holiness looks like Jesus. (laughs) Holiness looks like Jesus. Now, none of us, I don't think, would claim that we're all that close. Although Paul could say, remember, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Wow. (laughs) But holiness is to be like Jesus, in the image of his son, to live that out as the brethren and the sisterhood seek to be faithful servants. 
That's what it means. And we're called in history. You see, you can have something, people have great ideas. Yes, foreknown, yes, predestined. Yeah, but how does that work? Well, he's called us out in history. This is not just some abstract thought. We're here. <laughs> We're here. It's happening. He's called us. It's historical. Not just a desire of God, it's a fact of God. He's called us. We're here. He's also, as he said, he's justified us. We talked about this the other day. He's justified us. He's declared us not guilty of sin, not because of who we are and what we've done, but on the cross he took all our sin, no matter what darkness we put on him. And so when Jesus stands before the Father and we go up and stand on judgment day in, in front of the Father and Jesus, Jesus says, yes, died for, that, died for him. And when God sees me, he sees Jesus. Jesus took my sin, justified. I'm declared not guilty, not because of my works, but because of what Jesus did for me. And then he goes on and says, glorified. What does he mean by that? Well, that's the process of change in us. Some people call that sanctification. That change has begun because the risen Christ is in our life. As we've seen, the risen Christ produces the fruit of Romans 8, and that is what God calls glorified. We start to grow into the image of Christ until when Christ comes back again, we stand in that glorification perfection that only he can achieve through the final act of mercy into his life. Who am I? I am one that God knew before the world began. Loved. Who am I? I'm the one that God chose. And as a community, chose to be his child. Who am I? I am the one he's called to play that out now, in this stage of our life and history. Who am I? I'm seen as right before God without sin, not because of who I am, but because of what he has done. Who am I? This whole process is starting to work out in my life now and that glorification will be completed when he returns. I am a son of God. I've been adopted, chosen, in, therefore loved. <laughs> so you can't understand the next lot of verses until we understand that golden chain. You can't understand that prayer life. You can't understand all things work together for good until we understand that chain because that chain is then going to lead on to what Paul finishes up with. Well, if that's who you and I are, that's who we are, that's who we are, then clearly five questions answered by us, the disciples of the risen Christ. Paul puts them out there. Five questions. Look at them. Verse 31. Then Paul says, if this is who we are, if that's the golden chain, if you and I are in that golden chain, we understand the prayer life, we understand all that's gone on in Romans chapter 8, then, then, what shall we say? First one, if God is for us, who can be against us? First question, sort of like rhetorical, an unanswered question. Okay, you know all this, who can be against you? Well, go back to the slide. Who can be against you? No one. Because you've always been in God's plan. And you've always been in God's plan for forgiveness and glorification. No one can be against us. Clearly. Then Paul goes on and says, well, if that's the case, he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for, his, for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things? When we come to God in prayer, and now obviously God is going to answer according to his will and what he knows is best for us, but will he deny us anything that's not appropriate to be a child of God and to live out what he's called us to do? Well, how can you say that? He died for you, mate. I mean, if he dies for you, why would you actually ever think he's not going to do what's best for you and give what's best for you? So Paul's got the second question out there answered and then he goes on to a third question and he says 
Who will bring any charge against those God has chosen? It is God who's, who justifies. Who is he that condemns? So who's going to bring any charge against us? Well, the devil can't. We've been declared not guilty. The world can't. No one can bring any charge against you. They think they can bring charges. They think yeah, they might be able to arrest you in, in Russia or, or say to you, you know, you know your, your kids can't go to uni, you can't, or here, you're going to arrest you because of something you said about marriage or whatever. No, they can't bring any charge. This is not an arrogance. <laughs> it's just a question in Christ. I'm free of any charge. Who can bring any charge? In the context of obviously living according to his will. And he goes on. Who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is interceding for us. So who can even condemn us? Charge, condemn no one. No one. And then comes the biggie. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, hardship, persecution? Now what Paul goes on and says, no one's going to condemn you, no one can charge you, God, of course, is going to uh, you know, fulfill his gifts to you according to his purposes. And if God is for us, obviously, he is for you. No one can be against you. But then comes the last. Paul's hit list. Well, having said all that, who can separate us from the love of God? And he puts in everything you can think of. Illness, temptation, sickness, forces, governments, whatever it is. What can ever separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus? He gives us every possible explanation of what could separate us from God. And the answer is nothing. Death, life, experience, trial, temptation, falsehoods, nothing, nothing because of who we are. Nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And where he talks about heights and depths and powers, many commentators uh, say, and I agree with this, he's not only just talking about the world that we know and the, the forces that we deal with and the situations that we face in our own lives, he's also talking about the spiritual world and what happens in the spiritual world. By the way, the West has what we call an excluded middle an excluded middle. It has, this is what missiologists call it, we have God up here, us down here, and all that happens in the middle, the spiritual, the angels, the warfare, oh, you know, we don't need that, that's off out there. Not that we don't believe it, but really, you know. Believe in angels? Of course. I'll tell you an angel story, oh, come on, mate, what do you want? Uh, we have an excluded middle. Paul had no excluded middle. Most of the the Christians in this world have no excluded middle. We have so many resources and comfort, we just leave that out there. Well, there is a middle that's not excluded. We met Anna at a uh, conference. She asked us to pray for her because she was astral travelling. Astral travelling is where you believe you can lead your, leave your body and your spirit goes to another realm. It becomes a very dark exercise for most. And she got to the stage that she couldn't even control her astral travelling. So we prayed for her. And uh, off Anna went. Uh, surprise, surprise, about three years later, Anna is in one of my classes at Morning College. So I say to Anna, oh, tell your story, thinking this is going to be positive. She tells a story and about astral travel and what that meant and how she couldn't control that and and she went to the place that she didn't want to go, and it got so dark that she was being taken by a spirit guide. She had no control, even when she was asleep. Uh, the, Ross and he, his team, they prayed for me. That brought some sort of release, but then it came back again. Then I went to my church, which is a Baptist church, not too far from here, not here. I told them the story. They kind of went, oh, oh you know, this is a leap. Oh, yeah, God bless you, dear. We'll put you on the prayer chain. Uh, nothing happened. Then I went to a Pentecostal church. They took it seriously and they prayed for me like you did. And they prayed once or twice and I felt something leave me and I've never been the same again. I'm back. I'm back, Ross. I'm back. And I said, well, you're still in that church? No, no, no. She said, I'm back in the church 
Baptist church I was part of that said, you know, oh yeah, good luck, we'll put you on the prayer chain. So I just don't talk to them about it. Well, nothing separates us from the love of God, even the powers of darkness, even the things that we may slip into inadvertently. Anna is free in Christ. Nothing can separate her. Even the evil of astral travel is done in the name of Jesus. That's what Paul's saying here. You take whatever hit list you like, you put it out there, and I tell you, he says, nah, nothing will separate you. And there we have Paul's basic own testimony. So if you've got your Bibles open, either contemplate or read them with me, because I'm sure for Paul, he wants them to be our testimony. Romans 8, verses 38 and 39. Let's say it together. Think about it. This is what Paul says, and this is what we say as disciples of the risen Christ. For I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is that is in us, in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Amen. That's what it is to be a risen child of Christ. We're going to sing uh, one of my favourite hymns. I get the opportunity to do that. I normally don't choose two, but I did this time, sorry. <laughs> one of my favourite hymns, and you'll see why. Let's stand and sing. Christ has opened paradise. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of us in the week ahead. And the people of God said, Amen. Christ has opened the door to paradise. Bless you.